up on the stage. Uh, stage. This man has done more or less everything. He's got such a familiar voice. It's sort of, again, the hair on the back of my neck stood on end as soon as he opened his mouth backstage because we all know him. Uh, he's raced bikes. He's raced trucks. He's been a team manager. He's done everything. Uh, he's now a motorsports commentator and you'll recognise him for that. And guess what he does in his spare time? He's even a qualified pilot. Ladies and gentlemen, give an NEC welcome to the one and only Mr. Steve Parrish! Stevie boy, take a seat. Thank you there. very much indeed. Good, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Yeah, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Say, Where does the time go? I don't know. You were going to say good morning, weren't well, you? A lot then? of people come to see you. Oh, no, I think they come to see you, Stevie. No, I don't know. I'm sure that's what it is. Anyway. So, Steve, um, I mean, look, I just said you've more or less done everything. Let's just have a, a, a very brief synopsis of what you've done in your life, because it's uh, the main claim to fame is I've gone 43 years without a proper job. <laughs> so that's really what I'm very, very proud of. Yeah. Um, I did start being a mechanic at a very early age, and I got expelled from my uh, apprenticeship, as I did from my schools and everything else. Then I started racing motorcycles. Then I got signed up to be teammate to Barry Sheen with Suzuki's. And then my career ended because I got allergic to pain. And I got fed up with going to A&E, and I ran a team, which was good for five years, but if you won, the rider was great, and if you lost, the team manager was an idiot, so I got out of that. And then Mercedes-Benz took me on as a truck racer, I did that for 12 years, and then after they stopped racing in 2001 truck racing, I ended up working for the BBC, commentating on MotoGP and World Superbikes and British Superbikes and everything else like that. Uh, and now I have a theatre tour that's going around talking about all the ridiculous things that we got up to back in the days when you were allowed to get up to things as i said to you earlier pc in my days was stood for pulling crumpet um and like you could buck around i can't actually imagine i love motor gp but i can't imagine danny pedroza and jorge lorenzo doing a show in 20 years time about the troubles they got into because they don't they're not allowed to well if it's they all fart someone takes a picture, picture of it, of it yeah, yeah. And tweets it online i mean it's all i mean back in your day and, and uh, i'm sure you've got some amazing stories it's part of your tour but teammate to Barry Sheen you know did you room together did you get up to a lot of fun together I can't even go into what we got up to really but yes there was an awful lot of fun because back again in my days and I'm sure it was exactly the same in the car world we would go racing on Saturdays and Sundays and Monday Tuesday Wednesday Thursday Friday was just buggering around <laughs> getting into trouble <laughs> causing havoc pulling girls doing you know things that you do but nowadays and I follow it on Monday, the, uh, most of the riders will be in the gym. Tuesday, they'll go to see the dietitian. Wednesday, they might see the psychiatrist. Thursday, they'll see the, the engineers about something. And then they start racing Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Monday, back to the gym. You know, that's how it is. It's repetitive, and that's what they have to do. But that's the level it's at. My training scheme with Barry would go to Venezuela the 1st of January to the 31st of January. We would go water skiing every day, and we took our ball worker. Can you believe it? One of them things. I lost all the hairs off my chest on one of them. And that was it. Train for one month, which was really just mucking around, water skiing and eating fresh fish. Uh, and that was it. Then the rest of it was just buggering around. Fantastic. It was wonderful. It was great. We didn't make a lot of money, but we had a lot of fun. A lot of fun. So you had this amazing career in motorcycles, and I remember uh, going to see you truck racing at Brands Hatch. I can remember uh, seeing you at truck racing Brands Hatch, where you uh, you come off into a corner, and I always remember about truck racing that when when a truck comes off, it sort of takes half of the circuit with it. It doesn't only take you know the front of the truck and the and the front right wheel off. It also takes the grandstand, the banking. Yeah. In. yeah. You know, an interesting fact, well, I think it is, that we worked it out one time, the trucks that we raced had 1,850 horsepower. They would go wow. from 0 to 100 mile an hour about a second and a half quicker than a 911 turbo, for instance. But the kinetic energy of a five-ton truck doing 100 miles an hour was equivalent to a Formula One car doing 485 miles an hour. Wow. So you kind of get an impression of that kinetic energy, and you're absolutely right. At Brands Hatch, if you had brake failure, it wiped out Maidstone. Yeah. It was like, you know, it just kept going. Armco barrels, it would flick it out of the way. And I worked out fairly early on, the safest place to be was in the cab. Don't be a spectator. <laughs> no, you shouldn't be. What did you, I mean, you've obviously enjoyed both aspects of, uh, of that kind of racing, but what did you enjoy most, the bikes or the trucks? Undoubtedly the bikes. The bikes, in my mind, are the ultimate motorsport. I, I mean, I love, I've raced cars as well, trucks, you name it, but motorcycles the penalty is bigger than the crime you know we talk about the sharp edge the knife edge of, of motor racing and, and how finite it is well the big difference with motorcycle racing instead of having a flat spot or a spin out on the gravel or in the grass you're sliding down the road on your bum and then you have a look to see if you still got your legs and things like that so motorcycle racing to me was the most exhilarating of all because if you made a mistake it was a trip to hospital 
and the pinnacle still is. It still is, yeah. And the pinnacle of that uh, for both of us, because we both commentated on it. I've I presented it, and I've I've, I've bumped into you there. Uh, it's got to be the TT on the Isle of Man. Yeah, the TT is rather rather special. Again, you have to choose whether you want to do it or you don't, because it is massively dangerous. That again, the same deal. If you you know, you ride around the 37 and three mod, three quarter mile circuit. The bikes have got 220 brake horsepower. They're doing 200 miles an hour in places. And bless their hearts, you can't do much about it. They put a bale on a tree and a, and a, and a door and you'd have to be William Tell to hit it. I mean, yeah. it's like, <laughs> you've got to be very lucky. Yeah. So you just don't have to fall off. You don't have to make mistakes. And sadly, it does take people's lives. But the exhilaration that get you get from doing that. I never won a TT. I finished third on one occasion. That was the best I ever did. I but third... I have so much admiration for the guys that do that. Oh, I think third's good enough. Well, Absolutely. it was fast as fast as I want to go. I can tell I, you. I've I've ridden around the circuit quite a few times on on uh, just after practice days or done pieces to camera, and uh, you know I'm just happy to get round it in one piece. Yeah, yeah. I must admit the old toilet's fairly full just before they let you out. I can yeah, assure you. Certainly. But uh, just a very quick sto story. One thing I did do in 1977. We, through my friend Barry Sheen, we, I signed up to be in the British bobsleigh team. I know it's ridiculous, but it was a free holiday. So we told <laughs> Prince Michael of Kent that I was a good bobsleigh to get a free holiday. Went along, and I was useless, of course. I had this guy in the back called Piers Forrester who wouldn't get in the back until he got drunk. Anyway, cutting a long story short, we never got down to the bottom up the right way up. We always crossed the finishing line upside down. Got expelled from the British bobsleigh team. <laughs> that same following year, I was at the TT starting number six. I always rode number six. Nervous as hell, just been to the toilet four times. And who should come walking along? Prince Michael of Kent. And he looks in my visor and says, Parrish, I do hope you're better at this than bobsleigh. <laughs> ah, I have to go to the toilet again. <laughs> Fantastic. Now, Steve, um, you're on tour at the moment, um, and you've got this cracking little theatre tour. It's gone, it's gone down a storm. Rave reviews. Yeah. Uh, just tell people uh, where they can find you, where they can come and see you, and what the tour is all about. Yeah, it is the Mad Tour, and it stands, it is mad. It's stories that went on, but it stands for my adolescent dad, because my daughter hosts it. So, bless her heart, poor kid. Uh, her whole life. The, th the authorities should have taken away from me, really. <laughs> I used to take her to school in a hearse sometimes, maybe a trotter van, you name it. All these sort of things, poor kids. So anyway, she hosts the show, and we've done about 10 shows so far, and we kick off again in February all over the country. We're down south, up north, and done in small theatres, and it is about all the ridiculous things that go on. I have to check there's not a policeman in the room before we start <laughs> because of some of the stories. So it's gone really, really well. And we, in fact, we did one a couple of weeks ago at the National Motorcycle Museum, yep. which for your interest is just across the road. The National Motorcycle Museum is over there. Uh, they've got a display here, and we did a show there, and it was packed out, and everyone Fantastic. had a ball. So it's, uh, you know, brilliant, brilliant show. Really Fantastic. Pleasing. And if people want to find out a bit more about that, can they find that online? Yeah, www.madtour.co.uk. So madtour.co.uk, and you find out where we're at, and it's, uh, it's a giggle, I have to tell you. I, even I, even my daughter gets, she goes, I didn't even know that story. So <laughs> it, it's not that repetitive. It's about all the things that used to go on and the, and when you could get away with things. You can't anymore, can no, you? No, you can't. Well, Absolutely. somebody's always got a camera in your face. I'm starting to conform now. Uh, I'm not really, I was but just I'm about pretending. to confess a story, but I won't. Uh, but Steve, um, people here, you know, they've come to see you. You've got a lot of fans out here. If they want to catch up with you today, where can they find you? Where can they get over a picture Over on the stand over there, which is the National Motorcycle Museum. I'm over there with some wonderful old bikes. And in fact, they're starting them up. Uh, over the period of day, you can go over there and they'll fire some of the really old bikes up. So if you want to whiff a Castrolar and get a bit of a fix on petrol fumes, get yourself over there. It's in Hall 6, just over there. Fantastic. Ladies and gentlemen, wasn't that good? The one and only Mr. Indeed. Stevie Parrish! Thank you, mate. Thanks Have a good show. Enjoy the rest of the weekend. Thank you. How do you get out of here? Oh, that was go. fantastic. Okay, coming up on stage at 2 o'clock just...